Hi guys, I'm, uh, as mentioned, I'm Eric Johnson. I work for uh, indie game developer Arkham Games, and I also do some journalist stuff um, as well, working for DIY Gamer and GamingDead.com. You can find me on Twitter um, at GameConnoisseur if you guys have any questions that we don't get to today. So let's get right into it. Um, I will be talking about today effective PR, marketing, and community management in the indie game space. First off, why this stuff matters to indie developers. Exposure. Regardless of the potential your game has to be a hit based on design, how can it be expected to sell if nobody's ever heard of it? We'll be going over many different ways to remedy that. Second, reputation. Building a good rep with press, industry peers, and most importantly, players and customers, can, and even potential players and customers, obviously, can aid in the ability to financially sustain yourself as a developer, company, studio, and so on. And last, longevity. You should always have your eyes open for opportunities to sustain, to sustain yourself. Indie gaming's popularity continues to grow every day, and people in much bigger numbers than many have ever even anticipated are ready and willing to support your work in a variety of ways over the long term. So main topics we're going to be touching on. Uh, first, establishing a community. Second, seeking out mention and coverage. Third, organic marketing. Fourth, drawing up and building an effective marketing plan. And last, we'll be covering some overarching themes. So three points I want to touch on with establishing a community. First, build a connection with openness, respect, and accountability. Second, create maintain community landings. And third, give community members reasons to stay. So building a connection with openness, respect, and accountability. And it seems like common sense, but actually it has to be practiced. And I have a link for you guys here. I'll be posting all the links here in the chat box for you guys to take a look at if you'd like. So if you were... Um, Around the internet at the end of last year, you probably heard of Ocean Marketing, which um, at the end of uh, t uh, the year last year, a representative for their company uh, decided to make a series of bad moves when responding to a customer's legitimate uh, email complaints. It was over a pre-order uh, dispute. Uh, um, and he just took some really, really bad phrases here. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen some of them. Some, Welcome to the internet, bitch. That's how I roll. Things like that, uh, oh wait, you have to ask mom and pa dukes, you're not an industry professional and you have no money on Snap, you just got told. This is not how you should talk to your customers ever. So if you head over and do a Google image search for Ocean Marketing, sorry about that, uh, with that link, you'll see that the internet now hates him. So uh, my point in all this is you, if you treat your customers or your potential customers like dirt, then you can expect these kind of things to occur. Um, there's been a few good examples over the last uh, year or two of what can occur when that does it, when, when, when people speak out against their customers like that. Um, the internet will make sure everyone knows about your deeds. So if you think you're going to do something like that when a customer comes to you with um, a complaint or even worse, a legitimate complaint, go ahead and just run the other direction from your computer, break your fingers if you have to until you calm down and you can po properly respond. Now, what I'm getting at is that you have to learn to drop bad habit defense mechanisms. You can't take things so personal when someone comes at you um, or even just emails you with legitimate concern or, or um, comments on something. It, it's tough. It's tough to um, you're, you're natural. I'm getting uh, my mic back. back. Sorry. Sorry. Am I messing up here? Everything okay? Oh, that's my fault. Okay, yeah, sorry. Okay. So, uh, as, like, as I was saying, unless you're a natural at sort of just putting your emotions aside, then that's something you have to really work on. Um, it's your work. You're putting it out there. And unless it's a perfect prototype, you're inevitably going to take in some negative comment or something of that sort. So if the commenter is being constructive, you need to be able to address their concerns. Uh, you, you cannot come back at them with anything negative. Um, or if you're just being trolled, you need to be able to identify that and just not respond, period. Okay, so once you feel that you can talk to people, even those critical of your work, without letting emotions get the best of you, then you can start establishing yourself um, and letting them know if someone is on the other end of the line, and that will establish a connection for your community. If you're vigilant about, communica if, if you're vigilant about communicating, that plants the roots. Don't just expect all this to be presented directly to you on a platter either. Um, things like Google Alerts, referral link tracking for your website, those are great options to catch mentions of your games across the web when otherwise you wouldn't catch them. It's 
especially helpful as it allows you to respond to inquiries in various forms and comment threads um, where you can actually address concerns or questions of, of that matter. When you go into those, uh, be sure not to waffle with your speech. Be sure not to give any PR speak, specifically if you're not the direct programmer of the game or maybe you're one of the team members. Um, you have to be knowledgeable about what you're doing when you're going in there, when you're addressing their concerns or comments. Uh, and of course, be respectful as a new member of their community. Understand that even though you're the developer of the game they're talking about, you're still going into a new uh, community. And as such, you're a new member and you have to be respectful of that. So all this together, is like a long-term consistency of this, is going to result in members becoming evangelists for your company. And what I mean by evangelists is I mean that they're going to take any information you give them and they're going to run with it and tell other people about it. Uh, that's sort of organic marketing we'll be getting into lately, which is also um, along the lines of word of mouth. And it's a really powerful thing to have for more than just one reason, which we'll also touch on. All right, create and maintain community landings. Let me just get a drink real quick. Thank you. All right. Some quick notes here. Um, things like websites and blogs, uh, developer blogs, um, that should already sort of be, you know, ground level what you should be doing anyway. Even if you're not into open development um, per se, as in sharing all your work or, um, you know, when you go, go, go to your work, it's, it's behind closed doors. You should still share updates about that. Um, you don't have to share everything, obviously, if you're trying to keep certain things secret or behind, behind closed doors, like I said, but share something, you know, give them updates to follow along, give your, give your potential um, community something to go with. Uh, forms also promote great discussion, both between yourself and the players and um, between the players themselves. And just as long as you maintain these spots, you have everyone new developments to discuss, you'll find it um, uh, super helpful. If you're not updating it, then you can't expect any of those places to be active. Uh, same with social and news submission networks such as Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Google+, IndieDB, Reddit, Infra-G. These are all places that give options for your community on where they can go and find out new information or talk about your game. Um, you have to determine which one makes sense for you and which one, or which ones are, are right for you and your game at the time. Um, but you have to remember that community doesn't just mean people who have purchased your game and it doesn't just mean people on your forum or on your website. It's, it's much tougher to define. Its borders can stretch a lot further than you think if you're active enough and you give them those community landings to go to. Remember, some people aren't form builders, but they might be on Facebook. If, they, if you allow them to follow your game on a Facebook page, they'll do that. One example here is, and I'll copy this in again. Okay, this is the... Um, this is in the indie gaming subreddit of uh, Reddit, if you guys haven't heard of Reddit, which would be um, mean that you're not really on the internet that much because it's really popular. Um, it's got a gigantic community in general, and uh, they all have these sub-communities called subreddits. Um, anyway, I made a list about a, a few months back, or maybe it was longer than that, um, of all the different indie, specific indie game subreddits for, the, uh, for indie gaming to take a look at. Um, there's about 30 or so right now um, that continue to grow when new games come out. What's really cool is that these numbers continue to grow as uh, Reddit itself continues to grow as a community. Um, so there's a lot of benefit to getting on um, a site like Reddit because it's just, it, it is growing in itself. So if uh, Redditors have come across your game and don't like to leave, it, don't like, just like to frequent Reddit as their only website, but you have a subreddit, then they can do that. They don't need to go to your forums. They don't need to necessarily spend time there to communicate, to discuss, and to learn uh, what's going on with your game. Um, some have developer presence uh, on them, uh, these subreddits. Others are run entirely by the players. Um, they're hugely beneficial. Okay. So giving members reasons to stay. Uh, we talked about open development already. It all, uh, uh, we'll talk about it a lot more uh, in just a bit. It progresses discussion. It works great if you have a concept that wows from the start. Um, going in further with that, public alphas and betas, they can help immensely if your game is able to go that route. You can price these at what you think is fair. You can have video updates for people looking on the outside in to follow along with. And uh, it just gives you the opportunity to not only have people involved with the game early on in development, um, it also gives you a chance to uh, get feedback um, on your game in that, in that 
part of the process. Uh, a couple of there's definitely there's definitely a few people out there that are into the open development uh, style, and one of those let me just get this set up here is Wolffire, and their game they're currently working on is Overgrowth. Sorry, I didn't get the exact link there. If you scroll down to the Overgrowth 168 video change log, what's really cool about them is that they've they not only um, they give like one or two updates a week on average, but not only do they provide uh, their patch notes and, and uh, discuss what's different, they actually create a video for it. And uh, their game looks really good, so it's not a bad thing that they have a video every time. You can see sort of the rabbit combat going on here. Um, that's, that's a really smart thing to, get, to keep people involved. There's 53 comments on this particular one. There's a ton of, uh, that's a cool move right there. There's a ton of uh, interest in what's going on, and that's because these guys are active. They're giving you new content all the time. They're giving you something to not only talk about and read, they're giving you something to look about as well, or look at as well. Lastly, on this one, get a feel for your community. What are they into? You have to be creative. You have to be a human with them. You have to interact. Um, think what they would want. Think what think would, would be fun for them. The, uh, contests off the top of my head, game nights, even things like book clubs. Uh, it sounds tangential, but if you, if you go to somewhere for one reason and you stay for another or a myriad of other reasons, that's in itself, that's community. Um, you, you strengthen yourself by, by having more people come in, say, oh yeah, we love this game, we talk about this game, but we also do other things here. That's not a bad thing at all. Um, more on topic with the game itself, uh, if you want to focus on that, do they love, do your, does your community love to test? Do, you know, do they love to mod, create level content, create media, videos, uh, let's plays, things like that? It, you know, is there something in your game that people really want to, want, want to record? If it's possible, give them the option to do so in your game. Um, that's, those are huge benefits, and that can, that can be what leads to sort of that open or that um, organic marketing I'm talking about. We'll talk about a little bit. All right, moving to seeking out mention and coverage. When you have something to announce, online publications are a really great place to start, but you shouldn't stop there. Think of other places that might have interest, other media outlets that could have interest, print magazines, podcasts, radio shows, YouTube folks, um, let's the people who do Let's Play videos, people who do you know big video game coverage um, on on um, on YouTube, even local media should all be contacted when seeking coverage. Those are all places that can really aid you in getting um, mentioned and getting in getting your, getting some exposure for your game. Let your industry peers know as well. The growing corner of the gaming in industry we work in is really competitive, but it's also incredibly friendly. We're all trying to make it. We're all trying to carve our name for ourselves, but not just as individuals. As a, as industry as a whole, we're trying to um, catapult ourselves upward and show that we're legitimate. Um, success like Notches isn't looked on with bitterness by other indie developers. It's looked on with hope. You know, the sky truly is the limit. All, you don't need a ton of money. You don't need a, a big publisher behind you. All you need is a good idea, and you know, being in the right place at the right time and taking advantage of that. Also think about places where your niche or potential audience is going to lie. That's understanding and that's doing some research on what publications cover your platform, cover your genre, uh, if you have multiplayer, um, things like that. Think, just think, adventure games, if you have an adventure game, then you want to know Gnome Slayer. You want to know Cassandra uh, of IndieGames.com. Uh, both of those people are super into adventure games and they would happily take a look if you have something like that. Strategy games, strategy informer. RPGs, RP Gamer, Indie RPGs, PC Games, Rock Paper Shotgun, PC Gamer, Mobile Titles, Touch Arcade. Is your game on discount for a little while? Let Louis, uh, P Louis Proctor know of Savvy Gamer. He's always on Twitter. He loves to share game deals on his website. So you know, find a way to get that to him, and he, I'm sure, would love to share. Those are all things that you have to research throughout to find those those places where people are really wanna, are going to want to find out about your game. Um, there's a few guidelines dealing specifically with press that I want to go over. One, be unassuming. Don't get in your head that those you contact should be aware of you or your work or that they should automatically be really excited that you've contacted them to potentially preview or review their game. Press are often underpaid, overworked individuals, and they're going out of their way to do you a favor here. Um, you also have to think that they're probably doing this with a dozen plus other developers if they're active. So um, 
you just have to go into that knowing and, and just and just you know being assuming and working with them how, however they want to work with you. Um, be frank. Again, this is a great time to completely avoid any PR speak period. Uh, in interviews, for instance, many journalists are used to getting this, thus they're much easier to engage when you're forthright with them. You have to keep in mind sometimes who you're talking to, though. Um, if there's a piece of information you'd rather not have public as of yet, it's best not to mention it to them. Uh, I've seen people, developers, take things personally before with journalists. Um, that's their job. Their job is to get exclusive information. Their job is to get um, new information that no one else knows about or no one else has. So if you tell them that, then that's on you, and you should know that. Last, be generous. Mention that you're available at any time for an interview. You create exclusive screenshots for a preview. If that's you know what they're looking for, that would wow them. You're trying to provide. Um, you go out and provide a few license keys for them to give away to their audience. Basically, you're trying to get repeat business uh, out of these people. Your your hope is that they'll look to continue covering you any time you have something to announce. So you'll have someone who's working with you every time you have a major announcement. Going, oh, I really, I'm very interested in what you guys have and want to cover. That's also just a huge thing to have. So definitely be generous as well. Okay. Getting into the meat now, uh, organic marketing. We've already talked about um, open development a little bit, the dev blogs, the forums, the social networks. Um, personally, uh, we, at Arkham Games, we also have a wiki for all of our extensive details, patch notes. All those things are going to result in just basically a bevy of landings for people to browse when searching for your title or just wanting to find out information about it. Um, several, several people, are, uh, several developers are um, following that route. Unknown worlds uh, of doing natural selection two, Wolfire, as I mentioned. Obviously, that's how Minecraft started out. Um, crowdsourcing your concepts and features is a huge uh, thing with open development. Usually, there's a lot more feedback to take in, but hopefully, your game design ends up better because of that. And this is all um, pre-launch stuff I'm talking about here. I touched on public alphas and betas earlier on, and they're almost always in play here as well. So there can be some downsides to being so transparent, working so closely with the players. But to me, the pros always seem to outweigh the cons. In, in my opinion, uh, one of my personal favorites is uh, one of my favorite pros anyway. Is that in all of our games, we have a valley without wind, we have tideless, and we have AI war. Um, various players can actually point to something on the screen and say, "Hey, I suggested that to the to the developers, and they put it in the game. They even credited me in the patch notes." Of course, uh, that, that that's just awesome. That's like a really uh, cool thing, and, and that that that's that in itself is organic marketing. Uh, people who are proud of something that they had something to do with the game, or even they're proud of something with your game, they're going to tell people about that. Um, of course, there's plenty of times even the best intention testers can make suggestions that uh, sound good but won't work or just don't work. Period. So, of course, you know, be mindful of that. How you process all the various feedback received. That's something that you should be naturally doing anyway with open development is being able to weed out the good and bad feedback and putting it into um, and implementing it. Uh, so the other thing uh, on this one is word of mouth, uh, which I put in parentheses is the best thing ever. And that's not just true for any marketing. That's really true for any marketing. Um, players, in this case, in, in indie marketing, players are going to find something in your game that they're going to want to share, something they're either proud of, like we talked about. Maybe it's a mechanic. Maybe it's a feature. Or maybe it's just the entire game itself. Um, more Minecraft uh, stuff here. This is well because they're just a great example of um, how big a game can get if uh, it has it gives the options basically for players to take it and run with it. One of uh, this is what we're looking at right now. Let me give you guys the link here. What we're looking at now is uh, Hyrule Craft, which is the alpha version of um, the entire Nintendo 64 Zelda Ocarina of Time. Uh, being built inside Minecraft, and you you know it, at this point it's it's tough to even say oh that's insane because you've already said that so many times in the last year plus with Minecraft because that's what it's a lot of it has turned into with Minecraft is it's sort of a one upsman uh, ship uh, on what you can do and what you can show off. Um, basically, this is a great example of um, viral uh, and, and organic marketing because. Players can say, "Look what I did in this game," or in, you know, Terraria is a is a more of a co-op experience. Look what we did in this game, and look what you can do in this game. Um, 
So that that kind of oh, I better not go back quite yet. Uh, that kind of marketing at that point is pretty gravy. The, another great example of of a game thriving on word of mouth marketing is Bay Twelve. Well, that's the developer. Their game is Dwarf Fortress. And um, with seemingly no plan of marketing or advertising at all, it's become a, a, a sort of a, a hit. It's not hard to see why when you see how dedicated the game's community is. It's a free game, but the developers receive thousands of dollars in donations every month, and it's likely coming from players who want to ensure that these guys have the means to continue development because they're so into the game. Um, you can take a look here at some of the numbers. They uh, have marked 5,400 in, in December, in 2011, total they made 42,000, and they peaked out in 2010 uh, at 54,000. That's not bad for a free game. So they're obviously doing something right in the game itself, um, and that organic marketing is coming from that. Um, a great example of a game of organic marketing, and again with Dwarf Fortress, is this sort of epic comic that uh, a player put together. Now let me just scroll down. Oh, let me give you guys the link on this one too. Maybe some of you guys have seen it. I'm sure you guys have seen, heard all about the boat, mur boat murder thing as well. So, taking a look here, obviously there's a lot of art, art done here. Uh, this is all supposed to be sort of um, a retelling of the, of the experience of a player in the game. Now, what's really cool is when you get right here. We go here. You actually um, get to see the game, the game itself in this, in this image, in this very long uh, sort of epic image comic. And although it looks nowhere near as epic as the images surrounding it and, all, and as the tale kind of surrounding it, all we're actually taking in here is how the game uh, is perceived by the player. It, it, this, is how, this is how a player has taken his experience and has painted it for us to take a look at outside of the game. Uh, in this case, it's so inspiring that they've created this, this huge creative thing, and it's nothing, and it has nothing to do with marketing for them. They just wanted to do it. Um, so it's really a dream come true when that kind of stuff occurs. Uh, don't take it for granted. Uh, that's just a really amazing stuff, and and um, and things that you strive for uh, with that organic marketing. Moving on to drawing up and building an effective marketing plan. Uh, some. Some, kind of, um, some things we want to cover here. Malleable marketing throughout the development process, taking risks, getting creative, and knowing when to shut up. So malleable marketing throughout the development process. What I mean by this is that when called upon, you're able to tweak or take another direction with what you had in mind for your marketing plans. Sometimes it's best to just go with the flow. Uh, sometimes an opportunity will arise or for a promotion that you didn't um, know ahead of time, but if it makes sense, you don't want to miss out, so you want to be able to take advantage of those kinds of things. So you need to be able to adjust as you go through the development process and um, through launch and beyond that. Trial and error is specifically important uh, for any developers to gain knowledge on what is working and what isn't at a given time. I say that because the method is something those with little or no budget can and arguably need to experiment with um, to find out what works and what doesn't. Uh, because a lot of indie developers are strapped, obviously, and they're not going to have a budget or, or much of a budget for their, um, for their marketing uh, plans. So an example from my own work uh, of trial and error is our press release schedule. At one point last year, earlier on in development uh, of uh, Valley Without Wind, we were making progress in such leaps and bounds that we had major info to pass along um, on, a weekly basis, on a weekly basis to our press contacts. So I thought it'd be smart to get a fixed day of the week to share these updates, something like uh, evaluate out when Mondays or Tuesdays or something stupid like that, uh, thinking the press would really take to uh, and really enjoy knowing when the new info is going to be coming in on a specific day. Well, it turns out that wasn't effective at all, and we received less and less coverage every time we had a scheduled press release. And it wasn't really until we quieted down a bit, started putting together press announcements in more varied in intervals that we saw an overall interest uh, return and a larger uh, widespread interest return. Um, so you you have to keep that, that in mind that sometimes it's, it's 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 you have to just trial and error. You have to figure things out. And in, in that case, I learned that uh, with the press, they don't want to hear things uh, so periodically. They have a lot of things on their plate. You know, players might not mind that, but press uh, did in that case. You also have to know what's appealing about 
about your game. Uh, hopefully you have some idea of this from the get-go. It's, but it's just likely that players are going to discover something they find really exciting that maybe you didn't even expect would draw a whole lot of attention. Um, so you have to make sure you take that into account, that type of feedback, because it's critical you understand how others view your game to effectively market it. Uh, those features, those really cool features that players love, that's what you got to highlight. That's what you got to highlight in the trailers, the screenshots, press, re press releases, all those press pushes, and so on. Um, an example of a really nice trailer that uh, was put together is the Frozen Synapse multiplayer trailer, which I'm going to paste to you guys, play, and then grab a drink of water. So taking a look at the trailer, you can kind of see they're using um, press quotes that really exalt the game. And it's very strong points. They're using really strong taglines, uh, and then from there, as you as it leads in, it's well, it, even as it leads in, it's still it's pure action. It's it's what's really exciting about the game. Um, they use their concept art throughout, but there's there's a, there's a super um, there's a big focus on the gameplay itself, which always should be featured in any trailer you put together. Did not pass your phone along that link. There you guys go. Okay, and then um, last on this list is um, with all the above, you have to first and foremost trust your instincts. Uh, if you can't do that, then you have to develop better, more trustworthy instincts to rely on. For the most part, once things are in motion, you're going to be able to tell what in your plan is working and what isn't. You're going to say, I can see the results right here in front of me. Um, and the key is to be willing to actively adjust plans once you've, once you've you have that data, um, and, and um, once you figure that out. All right, taking risks and get cre getting creative. So first, no risk, no reward. And this is um, where I want to talk about pay what you want a little bit. We There's been pay what you want has been sort of big over the last couple of years, um, both for uh, individual games and for bundles. And none bigger, of course, than the Humble Bundle which currently still has the uh, Android bundle going on for another two days. Um, what's really cool about them is that they, uh, it's, it's hard to say it's open development since they're not really developing anything, they're selling games, but they're really open about um, all their statistics and all their metrics, which is really great because I think that that really drives up why this thing is so popular. We've seen... Um, you know, kind of copycat bundles uh, on, on the pay what you want or the super um, ma massive discounts uh, appear over the last year or so, and specifically like this last Christmas, there was, it was just like a bombardment of them. Um, and so, you know, things like this. Let's get back into the PowerPoint. You know, those are, those are, those are risks for for you as a developer to take, um, and that's more talking about games that are that are uh, after post-launch, although some people do launch with the with the um, certain bundles. So, you know, it, again, it goes back to trusting your instincts. You have to do your research. You have to really understand what kind of split uh, you're likely going to be taking, uh, what that's going to translate, obviously, financially to if, if past efforts hold true to form. Um, lately, with the exception of the Humble Bundle, most of these, uh, uh, most of these motions have leveled off sales-wise uh, quite a bit. Um, they're just not, in the last year or so, there was a lot of significant growth with Humble Bundle and some of the, and uh, Indie Royale had some good numbers at first, but everything seems to be leveled off a bit. So uh, you kind of have to ask, you know, where do we go from here in the risk factor when we've already reduced uh, the prices of indie games to basically you decide or, you know, nothing or next to nothing or whatever you, you choose. Um, so we, we don't know where, it's, where, where we're going next, uh, but I don't think bundles are going to be, uh, these pay-what-you-want bundles are going to last forever. There's already um, some holes in, in, in uh, what, what, what's done a lot. People already have games from bundles and don't want to buy them twice, things like that. Um, you know, I think it'll still be something that, that for like Humble goes on for a while, but I don't think you'll see it as, uh, as popular as it's been in the last little bit. So uh, who knows what's going to be next, but if you're not the one willing to take the risk and figure out uh, what's going to be popular next, you have to keep an eye on those who are doing that kind of stuff because someone's going to, someone's going to be paving the way, uh, so to speak, and you have to be, you have to be keen on that. 
uh, won't know until you try. That kind of, go, that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, Luke over at Radiant Games is, is, a, is a won't know until you try guy. He's just a really, he's been a mad scientist uh, when it comes to pricing his titles. He's a, he was originally an Xbox Live indie game developer who moved over to PC and iOS recently. During those transitions, he made some um, pretty interesting moves, and actually he's done this throughout his development. Um, he makes all these different kinds of shoot -em, uh, old school arcade shoot 'em ups. Um, and uh, I interviewed him for a new game site, uh, Diablo Gamer, a couple weeks back, and talked to him about some of his promotions. And one of the promotions he did, uh, which I think is great, is on um, he has about five or six Xbox Live indie games. And as he was getting those uh, ready for PC, he decided that he was going to sort of make a promotion out of that. So his promotion was, I'm going to raise all of my Xbox Live indie game prices to the maximum amount on the channel, which is five dollars in two weeks. So it's a two-week promotion, and if you uh, if you get the if you buy in the next two weeks, you get the game at the low price. If not, it goes up forever, <laughs> and it's at five dollars. Um, so that you know, like I said, that's he's a mad scientist. He tries different things, but um, you know, and although not all those promotions are going to you know go extra or extraordinarily well, he's done some other things with um, selling bundles before he sells his individual games for lower prices total. Um, maybe not all the promotions are going to go as expected there. But you're going to gather valuable data when you do that. You're going to have something to chew on going forward that other people may not. You're just going to have information, and that's valuable for you when you do that kind of stuff. And then last, uh, and this is a little bit trickier, tie it into the game content itself. You have to be careful here. Um, a good example of a, of a really creative tie-in uh, that works is uh, Vil Vilambir's uh, Super Crate Box on iOS. It tracks total crates collected for those who play online. It's a game about just collecting crates and trying to stay alive against these enemies. It's a simple arcade game. And it collects, like I said, it tracks total crates across all players who have purchased the game online. And then it releases new content updates when certain crate milestones are reached. Um, they're actively developing this, adding on new content, which I think is brilliant. The whole thing seems to be going really well. They're at, they're, last time I checked, they were over three quarters of a billion. Uh, crates grabbed by players already, and their first content goal was 10 million, so they're busy with an update already, uh, like another update. But that's a really cool example of tying that in, and um, but not but not sacrificing anything with your game, and not sacrificing anything with the, the uh, play relationship either. Um, they're getting free content by playing the game more. That's all that's happening there, and that's really that's really smart of them. Uh, loyalty discounts on the previously mentioned alphas and betas is another sort of less creative example uh, of that, but both can drive sales at different points in the game development uh, in, game, in, in the game's development or lifespan. Knowing when to shut up, which I will be doing soon here. Uh, first, when is it enough with your game? When is when is uh, sharing with your game enough? Know when you've reached a, a saturation point, and then try to make that a little bit before. Uh, try to cut off cut off uh, communicate a little bit before that. You're always hoping to leave people wanting more. The saturation point can differ depending on who we're talking about. Um, involved players, like I mentioned, don't mind daily, weekly updates, but press, as, as we found out, sure as hell don't care for them. Understand the balance. Don't bombard people with too much information. While I said earlier you should always put your best foot forward by showing off the cooler features of your game uh, in the rear press pushes, trailers, and so on, you should always have a few aces up your sleeve as well. Uh, players leave things for players to discover uh, in your game because that gets back to organic marketing, word of mouth, and it's naturally always going to sound more exciting if someone hears about your game from someone else than you, because of course you have a conflict of interest, of course you're going to want to tell them about their game, but if someone else does, that's a huge difference. Just going to check time real quick. Okay, we're getting pretty close. Uh, so major items to consider. Price point, it's, a huge, it's huge nowadays because um, you have to think about how it will sell at the point versus everything else out there. You have to think about um, if you want to participate in major discount promotions, how much it's going to cost at 50% off, how much that's going to make at 75% off or more if you do those kind of daily deals or, or those kind of things like the free app a days um, or the lowering of the price. Uh, of course, you're going to get more sales when you lower your percentages, but you have to, you have to keep that in mind because a price point is more set in stone. That's why I don't like uh, permanent price points. I wanted to talk, talk on that real quick. Permanent price, permanent price drops to me. Um, shouldn't happen in the first six months to a year of the game's release unless it, it feels like it's really necessary. Because to me, it says uh, we didn't really know we we weren't we weren't right on the price uh, originally. Um, there's so many ways to temporarily reduce your price uh, of your game now that you 
you a permit price drop seems really drastic to me. Um, it's all all the price point stuff. It's instincts again. You just have to be really honest with yourself. What is that? What have I put into this game? How much time? How much content? What does that translate to? And then you put a price tag on it and say this is what the cost of the game is. Platforms and services. Obviously, um, you have to choose a, a launching platform or, or a platform to start with. Uh, you can explore your options. That's, that's early on in the process. You can explore your options down the road from that choice. But if you're making a game for iOS, Android, uh, or console, um, your choices are a bit more reduced. If you're on PC, Mac, then there's more options. Uh, you can sell the game yourself with a, a process, processing service like Fast, fast, uh, fast Spring. Um, of course, if you want to reach wider audiences, you'll want to get on some of the key digital distributors, um, none, more, none more large than Steam due to its dominance in the PC market. There's really different ways to go about getting in touch with these distributors to pitch your game. But the same rules apply here as they do with community and, pr and press. You have to be an assuming, respectful, and all that. And specifically with this, you want to really make a strong first impression with them. So make sure that when you pitch your game, uh, it's ready and you're ready to go on that. Promotional opportunities, uh, we talked a bit about that. Um, before, during, after launch, once it's understood where your game is going to be available, where you know it's going to, if it's going to be on a service or if you're selling it by yourself or whatever, take a look at some of the promotions that you can run or that are typically run on the on the um, platform. Determine if any of that would be right for you now in the future. Um, if you're selling independently or you think you have a good enough idea to pitch uh, to your service, get creative, uh, put it together, bring it up to them. You know, they're very open to this and it can drive a lot of sales for them and drive a lot of sales for you as well. So some other routes of exposure to cover real, real quick. Um, exhibiting, which is another type of risk reward, um, and actually goes a little bit more into the uh, putting money, yeah, yeah, put money in it first, so it, it falls more into the God spend money to make money category. Some games are made for showing in large noisy rooms and some aren't. Uh, Again, instincts. Benefits uh, you can potentially get out of this, though, is are measurable. You can have several one-on-ones with players um, during demo sessions. You can gather knowledge, and if you have a keen eye for it, you can collect data, knowledge um, during these set sessions, and you can get a real grip on what's working in your game, what isn't, and what's confusing to players. And that's through the player's eyes, which is again super critical. Um, it's a good idea to have your game for sale if when you decide to exhibit, as it gives attendees the option to purchase right as soon as they get home or sooner, depending on the platform. And again, you can get creative here, but you just have to make sure that you're not being obnoxious. Again, be respectful of all that, uh, of your space. Kickstarter, which has been in the news recently because of um, Double Fine's record-breaking uh, efforts, which now are, is well over a million dollars over its original $400,000 goal. Uh, Kickstarter sites like 8-Bit Funding, Indiegogo, they're, they're definitely viable options. Um, in Kickstarter's case, it's all or nothing as far as your target goes, so you have to keep that in mind. So if you know what you need financially to get by for uh, development and you think you can get that donation uh, level hit um, because you have a, uh, a prototype or a concept or whatever that you think is really going to wow from the start, then go for it. Um, make that your marketing plan. Understand, though, that there's various pros and cons. Um, Cliff Harris of Positech Games mentioned recently uh, about the Double Fine. Instead of one publisher breathing down uh, Double Fine's neck now, there's potentially uh, tens of thousands. Uh, not, not that they're all going to be the publishers and such, but they're going, they expect something now that they donated to the game. Uh, he points out the uncertainty of the design and development process. It's hard to predict exactly what's going to come out from all this. But all of a sudden, it has to be really, this, this has to be a really, really good adventure game, and there's going to be a lot of upset contributors. And that's, that's on Double Fine, and I'm sure they're totally aware of that, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, but the risk-reward system has paid off handsomely, handsomely for them so far, and they've made a lot of uh, waves in the ocean with what they did there. So to wrap up, before we get into some questions here, some overarching themes. Um, be accountable. Be upfront. Uh, seriously, don't be a dick, as we as we talked about earlier. You have to be frank. You have to avoid PR speak with whomever you're chatting with about your product. If they ask about something that could reflect negatively, don't skirt the issue. You want to address it. You want to let them know what your plans and thoughts are on that item going forward, and they will be wowed because that's not what people are used to getting when when they are when they confront people like that. It just goes a really long way when people know you're not bullshitting them. It really does. Um, staying involved with your community, giving 
more opportunity to stick around as a presence in the, in the, in the industry. We touched on that a ton. That's, that's, that's key. Build your community up. Um, keep it active. Know when to mix it up or even shut it down marketing-wise. Never believe, though, that you're, you've extended your reach too far. As long as the accessibility of gaming and the number of gamers in general continue to grow, there's always going to be new people out there that want to discover your work. They just don't know about it yet. So that's up to you to get that out to them. And then uh, trial and error. You have to take risks. Uh, you have to determine what's working and what isn't and make adjustments from there. Uh, sure, a great game may sell itself, but why leave it to chance? People want to play your game if it isn't crap, of course. Um, obviously, marketing shouldn't even come into your mind until you have a product you're proud to promote. As long as you can take pride in your product and believe it will appeal to someone, you should have something to market. It'd be foolish not to take advantage of that, not to go out and seek out the individuals and audiences that could have interest in your game. If you don't have time to do this by yourself, you should consider hiring a new team member to take on that work. Uh, note that I said team member, not marketing firm or partner. To get the most out of an employee taking on these tasks, they, he or she has to be part of that process from as early on uh, as can be. You want, them, you want them to be as far from PR guy as possible. And the more they're in the loop with the different facets of development, the more you can get out of the hire. That goes for hiring community managers as well. They're often dealing with community directly, obviously, sorting and responding to very specific questions, comments regarding the game. So they have to know the product. You have to, you have to spend time with that. Don't even deal with any PR stuff. Just have someone come in and work with you on that level. Uh, if you can't pay them right then and there, consider a royalty deal or something along those lines, percentages, that idea. Um, anything you can do is great. All right. Okay, we're right, right out of time, so thanks so much for listening. That concludes um, my end of the talk. Uh, I'll turn it back over to our conference chair, and we, or our chair, and we can talk about, uh, and we can take any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. That's a really interesting session. So uh, there are 66 people sat around, so I'm sure somebody's got a question. Go back to the top here. No questions so far, but a couple of comments uh, saying how much they enjoyed the session, and um, I'd like to add to that as well. I think that was a, a really good session, particularly because I missed well, it the first time around. Oh, well, thanks so much, everybody. And uh, always, if you have questions, like I said, that come come in mind down the road, you guys can grab me on uh, Twitter at Game Console, um if um, questions come a little bit later. So uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in now. Uh, so... Uh, Garrett asks, if no one knows who I am, where do I start with marketing? That's the best because you have you can start anywhere. Um, <laughs> specifically, you have to start, before you can just start shouting about, out about yourself, um, you have to have a product. If you have a product, then you can start talking to people and, and, and such. Um, whether you want to contact industry peers directly and kind of get some advice or if you want to just start throwing things out there, I would suggest um, if your game's ready to go, getting, getting an indie DB game page set up, um, start establishing an audience there, uh, anywhere. Basically, all those, all those um, networks I talked about, um, social networks I talked about earlier, um, Reddit, Infra-G, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Google+, if you want to compete, if you, wanna, if, you wanna, uh, if you think you can stay busy on those. But just to start a website, a blog, um, development updates, just that kind of stuff is marketing. You're letting people know that you exist, that your game is uh, being actively work, worked on. And then from there, you're trying to um, communicate with industry peers about it, uh, press, letting them know, and, and go from there. But uh, like I said, if, if you're starting from square one, the sky's the limit. You just need to, you just need to start. start. You, know, you, don't, you, just, you, don't, you don't want to sit there going, oh, what am I going to do and spend the whole time uh, planning. It's all bits and pieces, and as you continue to go, like I said, you'll be it'll be malleable. You'll you'll continue to uh, rework and retweet the plan as you go through development. Cool. Uh, so Phil Carlisle asks, uh, I'm interested in how to keep a small community engaged with minimum effort being a sole indie. That's a, a great question. Um, you know, minimum effort is is. It's you know it's it's difficult. There's a lot of things you 
I'm sure that you're busy with. Um, so minimum effort there would be to give the player something and run with uh, on your part to say, uh, you know, I can't be here all the time to, to actively engage uh, with this whatever it is that we're talking about, whether it's a um, something to do with your game or something that maybe doesn't have anything to do with your game. But uh, giving, not, I'm not saying like giving them homework or anything like that, but give them something that they can progress um, themselves that, do, that doesn't necessarily need your attention, that doesn't necessarily need your, your guidance throughout. Um, and that way, you know, that, that, especially with a small community, they can keep active. And like I said, your updates, things like that, giving them, giving them you know, progress reports, that's going to engage them right off the bat. But if you want to give them something extra, you, know, you have to just be creative and come up with something that they can sort of play with without your presence being there. Um, okay, so next question is uh, a couple of questions along a similar sort of line. Uh, but how early is too early to get started on everything? So uh, this is a question from, uh, or similar theme from James, from Charles, uh, and a couple of others. Uh, for it's example, what kinds of states should the key features be in before starting a dev blog? That's, those are great questions. Um, so personally, uh, Arkin Games, we are super open in development. We started sharing uh, media and, and such three weeks into development, um, which is insane at some, at, in some rights, but uh, we felt that that's sort of our process. And um, it was funny, Rock, Paper, Shotgun actually picked up that uh, our press push there in three weeks in, and we got absolutely murdered in the comments because of uh, how the game uh, looked in the video in the screenshots. And um, all we could say is, you know, we've only spent so little time in that. And that's one of the cons, obviously, of open development that you and, and um, that you know, if you don't have thick skin for, then you probably shouldn't uh, be entering, obviously, the space that early or or, or you know, pushing that early. Um, you want to uh, with with Chris Park and Arkham Games. He's so excited to share concepts and all that stuff. So if you're excited about your concept, then you can start sharing right from the get go. Um, but you have to understand, and hopefully your audience will understand that too as you go along, things are going to change. Things are not going to be the same. A Valley of That Wind is wholly different um, other than, well, I shouldn't say wholly because we have immutable design goals that have, well, we've stuck to very closely. But if you look at the game from three weeks to three months to six months to now um, a year plus into development, it's changed so drastically. Um, so there's no real way... To, to know, hey, is this, are these key features going to be the same um, months down the road if you're, if you're doing that open development process, if you're doing that through development. Um, but if, you're, if you decide to go, well, I'm going to be sharing a lot with post-launch or, or right before launch, basically, when a lot of uh, developers make their push, then that's when you want to kind of figure out what those key features are. And again, you can, uh, testers can help you there. Um, people who, who are taking a look at the alpha, beta, whether it's, whether it's private or public. Um, obviously, in our, our belief is the more the merrier because we can get more feedback that way. Um, but you figure out your key features, like I said, through the players in a lot of ways and, and the testers. And so you, you take that and that's when you start putting that in. But like I said, until you have those testers, you have to make that call yourself. So, um, you know, it's different for every game. It depends on what kind of game you're putting together, what kind of, it does, does the game allow f to be shown earlier, or, or is it something that you want to keep behind um, closed doors for longer? There's, there's a lot of questions, and each individual case is going to be different. So we've got time for one more question, uh, and that's going to come from Jamie. Uh, and he says that crowdsource funding like Kickstarter obviously works best if you have established credibility. So Double Fine had that in spades. How could a newbie go about establishing credibility if they want to try going down the Kickstarter line? That's a really good question, and actually, I did have some of that in my talk, but I saw that we were running out of time, so I had to sort of just talk about Double Fine. The other two, we can kind of take a look at these links real quick if we have time. The other two I wanted to point out, um, Blindside, it, uh, the audio adventure video game. This uh, was a game uh, that was posted a few months back, I think two, three months back. Um, it's a it's a video game with no graphics at all, uh, played entirely with audio. They create a fully 3D world that you never get to see as a player as you're blind. Um, so these kind of concepts are great for Kickstarter. They're unique. They're creative. 
um, they're what people want to support. They, people want to create, want to support really creative ideas or or, or ideas that have leg, uh, legs to them. Um, now, obviously, like you you, go, you mentioned, Double Fine ha, had a had something established already, um, but these guys did not. They, they they you know they came forth with a really creative idea, and um, that's that's something that really flourishes in the Kickstarter space and in the um, in the crowd uh, funding space. My other example was Octodad too. Now that kind of like falls in the in the middle. Um, Octodad originally was a freeware title uh, with a hilarious concept of you playing an octopus uh, and trying to trick everyone into believing that you were a human father, uh, which is which is just great. I thought it was a really funny concept. And in this case, th my example here is not that they have credibility, which they did um, going into it, um, but I also think that a lot of their pledges were based off of uh, the character. Uh, Octodad is a really, really funny uh, intellectual property, and that probably, or, or just sort of creative, and I'm sure that brought in a lot of people there as well. So, with Kickstarter, that's like I said, it's it's a it's a marketing effort in itself. Um, you know, sometimes, like Kickstarter is all or nothing. So that 30 days, it, it it's it's like a it's like you're, it's like a reduced bubble of of that full development marketing plan that I talked about because over 30 to 60 days or whatever you're. Um, whatever you set for yourself on that Kickstarter, you have to be able to not talk too much. You have to you have to still update people because unless unless you get super lucky and just go flying over your um, your goal, which does not happen obviously to everyone. I think the I think it was something like sixty eight or seventy two percent fail. Um, I don't remember where I read that. That was probably a few months back, and that might not be correct. But I know it's more than less fail uh, Kickstarter efforts fail than they do succeed. So you know, you, it's it's certainly not something that you just put up there. It's certainly not something that you just decide to do on a whim. It's a full, it's a part of the marketing plan. It's a full, uh, full on decision that you have to make and then commit to. Um, but like I said, if you feel like you have something that's really going to wow off the concept, off of a video, off of whatever gameplay you have, you can put together, then that's when you want to do it. And you don't have to do Kickstarter at any given point in your development. That's that's what's cool is that you can find a point where you go, okay, now is the point where I have something that I can show off here and try to get the finances I need to finish this game. 